you went to UCLA for a diagnosis of your condition that would normally be identified via autopsy. This yes. is freaky. That's a freaky fact. Yeah. What, was there some new way to make the measurement or did you just sort of force, force it in on people and say, look, something's going on. Invent some new test because otherwise I don't want you to do this after I'm dead. This is Star Talk Sports Edition. I've got Chuck Nice, one of my co-hosts, Chuck. What's up, Neil? All right, all right. Every time I'm here, I, I have to list you as comedian and actor, and I haven't seen you act in anything. Just, look, I, just between you and me. I, Ooh, I don't know what see, the, that's how great of an actor I am. No, <laughs> because you just blend <laughs> in. I, I don't even know it's you. You don't even okay. know it's me. <laughs> yeah, okay. You're like, I thought that was Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> what? That was Chuck Nice. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe that's it. And, of course, Gary O'Reilly. Gary, former hey, soccer man. pro in yeah. the U.K., so Gary, you you felt compelled we could not keep doing Star Talk Sports Edition without hitting this topic. So why don't you give us the full intro that this needs and requires? So what's Thank going you. on today? Um, right, CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a degenerative brain disease caused mainly by repeated traumas to the head. Now concussions are the most dramatic of those, but it could be from years of heading a football. It could be from Smaller contacts. It could be from contact sports like boxing or maybe American football. Oh, when you said heading a football, you mean heading a soccer ball? Yes. Because this America football. Jack. Right. Yeah. Just <laughs> our, our footballs aren't round. <laughs> yes, we don't have round are. footballs here. <laughs> Look, I think if, a ball, if, if a ball hits a football player in the head, that's, that's something wrong happened in that right. play. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if All I right. say soccer, I get pushed back. If I say football, I get pushed back. I don't win. So no, it, that's true. That's true. It's, you know, it's a square ball. Look, the thing is, CTE is not particularly well understood. And up until recently, Diagnosis took place, sadly, through autopsy. Ooh. Imagine. Oh. Symptoms, right? Symptoms can appear years or even decades after the last head trauma occurred and can present, and this is spooky, really, memory loss, severe headaches, erratic behavior, and tragically, suicidal tendencies. Yeah. Now, Neil, mm. this literally hits home for me. I had 14 years as a pro. I didn't just head a soccer ball. I practiced heading a soccer ball. Oh, you did it even when you, oh. Right, because oh, there's, a, there's yes. a technique. There's a way to do certain things in a certain way. So this is interesting deeply for me. Now, our clinical expertise will come from our good friend and neuroscientist, Dr. Heather Berlin, who will join us later in the show. But let's meet somebody. Um, nine years ago, this person was diagnosed with CTE. And I want us to listen to their story and hopefully walk away from this podcast having learned something and having become enlightened on a subject that is only in the last few years receiving the attention it deserves. So I would like to introduce our guest, Leonard Marshall. Now, if that name sounds familiar, this is a two-time Super Bowl champion. This is a two-time Pro Bowler, two-time NFL Defensive Lineman of the Year. That's not where it ends. He's also been a professor of sports management at Seton Hall Stillman School of Business. He's an advocate for athletes who are suffering from CTE, and he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the NFL to win a class action case to get money for other players who aren't as affluent but are suffering all the same. He's also an entrepreneur. He's also a philanthropist as well as a CBD advocate. Neil, please. Don't have oh a chat gosh. with Leonard. Uh, Leonard, welcome to Star hey. Talk. Dude. Hey, well, thank you very much for having me. Gary, what a great introduction, and uh, I sincerely appreciate that and some of the touching points that you uh, that you uh, eloquently talked about. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't say it. How's nope, that? Nope, that's true. I yeah. would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just catch some people up on some on your resume here. So, uh, if I understand correctly, if you're in the Super Bowl, you can't also play in the Pro Bowl. Is that correct? Well, that was before uh, uh, today's football. Right. Yesterday's football, you finished the season, 
And then two weeks after the season was the Pro Bowl. So you would play the Super Bowl and then you would fly to Hawaii. And, and it was kind of a and still and still do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a gift and a curse at the same time because your body was so beat up in the Super Bowl. So you were ready for the season to be over if you played in the Super Bowl anyway. But most guys went to the Pro Bowl just to kind of have fun, drink Mai Tais, and uh, lay on the beach. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, if, if I won a Super Bowl, I'd still go to Hawaii, right. and I'd just lay on the beach, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'd go to right. Hawaii with a uh, very sudden ankle injury <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. before the game. Yeah. Yeah. Worst case of broken eyelash ever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, Leonard, you've got here a, a book titled When the Cheering Stops. Yes. And, oh, my gosh. I mean, that's a – what a title of a book that is. I mean, you know, it's it's almost as though whatever are my worst th thoughts, that's what's going to be in that book. And so what at what point were you motivated to say more people have to know about what has happened to me? 2007, 2009, Neil, I began having issues – I felt well, with traumatic brain injury. I started receiving phone calls from friends of mine around the league, guys that I had played with and against. And, uh, and several of those guys were, they were kind of stuck. They, they felt like they didn't have an outlet. They were having some real problems at home. They weren't able to articulate what was going on because they really didn't know what was going on. All they knew is, you know, when they played the game, and they were concussed in the game, they were told just what every other tough guy is told, rub a little dirt on it, you know, rest a little bit, and go on back in there and do what you do. Well, that just doesn't work well with 310, 20-pound linemen in the National Football League when men are playing for money. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. So I didn't find out till I'm going to say, a cool 10, 12, 14 years after the game uh, was over for me. Because uh, my career ended in 1996, and uh, I became a dad in 1995. So the entire time that I'm going through this process, I'm 100% concerned about what's going to happen to my little girl if I'm unable to be her father. What is my wife going to do when she has to take care of not only my child, but me too? And then what is the league going to do to make sure that the quality of my life does not diminish because the one thing you don't get when you leave pro football is health insurance benefits. Yeah. Well. You get 18 months of COBRA, and if you don't go into private business or you're not smart enough to connect yourself with a company uh, to gainfully become employed, you will have the, the biggest problem in the world in trying to find an insurance carrier that will underwrite you of course. after a career in the National Football League. Because you're bringing baggage. Is it so, still that way? Wow. It's still I'm, that way. It's still that way. It's still I, that way. I remember some time ago during a um, player negotiation with the owners that that was on the table, some form of health care. So, and they, they quashed it. Like the owners, they just quashed it right away. This is something that they really are adamantly against. Yeah, you're not you're not getting Chuck. You're not getting that 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 forty acres in the mule when you retire and you walk away. You just not going. It's not going to happen, you know. Yeah. And, and I don't know why. I don't know why that the predecessors that continue to be involved in professional football they haven't taken a stronger stance on that, especially for the guys that built the game, like myself, right? Like the household names of guys that you knew and know of, right? You know, uh, doing your genre of, of, of work and everything else, so yeah. it just it just doesn't make any sense, guy. Well, by the way, you were a, you, you were a household name in my house because you played for the Giants, and uh, I'm an Eagles fan, so we right. just hated you. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, as long as you, you know want to make friends, Chuck. No, because he ate he ate quarterbacks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Leonard was like third time in in the Giants' history or something like that. Yes, the third of all time. And yes. uh, most of those sacks were against uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. So uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> so the thing, the thing here, Neil, is what Leonard said reminds me of a wonderful phrase, and I can't remember who is the author of this, but standing on the shoulders of giants. Right? Yeah, of course, this, this Isaac Newton. This, that Isaac right. Newton said Thank it. you. Yes. Okay. There you go. Uh-huh. If, if, if I can see farther than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders 
of giants who have come before me. And Correct. giants like Leonard, and the, and he he's respectful of those that came before him. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a it's a it's a heritage and a lineage that should be carried forward. Absolutely. And people need to learn to look backwards sometimes and not just forwards. But but also I just want to add, if if correct me if I'm wrong, Leonard. Sure. Uh, football careers relative to tennis, soccer, baseball are notoriously short because you can't do that, you know, at, late into your life, as in 30s and early 40s, the way many baseball players do. So the many football players, again, correct me if I'm wrong, this is just my understanding, are not the, the, the marquee players that make the zillion dollars that are household names. Most of them are, 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 are service players filling out the team. And so they don't then have these huge financial reserves to then carry them out for the rest of their lives. Is that well, an accurate characterization? Yeah, accurate characterization uh, when I played the game from 1983 to 96, because keep in mind, I went through two strikes in the NFL. Um, I went wow. through the strike in 87, and I went through the strike in 92, which granted us free agency. So I'm one of the pillars of what you see now in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, compensation players are being paid. Mm -hmm. Let's just put it like this. For the Giants to put my team on the field that won the Super Bowl in 1986, they would have to borrow money from the Jets to do it. Mm. Right? <laughs> because there's no way you're going to have two defensive players side by side like Chuck talked about, Lawrence Taylor and Leonard Marshall, That's right. with over 200 quarterback sacks between them, and a middle linebacker in Harry Carson, who's also a Hall of Fame linebacker, on the same defense along with George Martin and Carl Banks and Jim Burke. There's those seven guys, they will never beat seven players on the field at the same time on a team like that ever again. They just don't have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. They don't have the competition. Leonard, <clears throat> let me ask you a question because oh. you had 714 tackles during your NFL career. Correct. Right? How many times did you get tackled? How many times did you get hit? And should that actually go down now as a stat that people recognize? Well, I could tell you this. If you want to talk about getting dinged in a football game, mm -hmm. I could tell you how many times I got dinged. Now, dinged to me is when you get hit or you have a head to head collision yeah. and you get up and you don't know where you're at. Oh, I, I, oh. Couldn't, tell you, I couldn't tell you how many times that happened. Okay. Ooh, ooh, wait, 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 Leonard, Leonard, and you calling that just a ding? Yeah. There's got to be a worse word for that. Come yeah. on, Leonard. Come uh, on. It's, it's called, called life-changing event in my life. <laughs> it got Mule. banged upside the head. Come on, Leonard. These, Give these me a are, word for that. Yeah, these are proud, tough guys yeah. Yeah. Who, who are playing yeah. a game for money. And the, the thing is, if you show softness, right. guys will come after you. Yeah. Oh. They, they, they said, "Get your bell rung. You get got your, your bell, bell rung." rung. Exactly, Chuck. And I'm like, "What is it? The Liberty Bell? Because God." <laughs> yes. See, the thing, the thing is, if if you show the weakness, not only are you lit up for your opponents, but your coach is looking, and all the coaches Absolutely. around him is looking, Ooh, and you don't get to play in the next and game. My coach it's was a nut job. I had a nut job of a coach by the name of Lamar Leachman <laughs> from Cartersville, Georgia. Let Let me tell you something. This guy, he, he looked like Hercule Rock from the Flintstones. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He had a curly afro. He talked like he was black. He was he was a five foot eight, five foot nine white guy from Cartersville, Georgia. That that was, I, I it just looked like Hercule Rock, man. He had these big old arms, little bitty legs. They would he was knock me, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it, was the funniest, it was just the funniest. <laughs> I don't want to swear on you, but it was the funniest thing you had to see, man. And, and and he'd walk around and he'd tease guys. He'd go, "Oh, what happened to you there, pretty? You were too you were too soft on that play." Oh man, and it, there it is. And knock the living I don't know what out of him. There it is. So, you know, you had guys like that. Wow. So so me, let me I can quantify this because I did a calculation. All right. And so so you were six you you were six four. Um, and how far, how fast did you run a 40? 4.7 seconds. Damn. Okay. And, and you came you mean, in at what? At, I, came <laughs> I came in the NFL. I weighed 290 pounds. I slimmed down. I was, I was at 18% body fat. I went down to almost 9% body fat, Wow. 282 pounds. And I could bench press 500 pounds and squat almost 800 pounds. Okay. And I'm telling you when, when, my, my coach had a motto. When hit, the body will bend or break. 
his deal was he wanted to see if somebody could knock a player, hit a player so hard that he could knock him into the middle of ne- next season. Tuesday. <laughs> yes. yes. All right. So, so here's the thing. I did a calculation. All right. So there's the energy of a bullet fired from a rifle. So the AK-47, which is a high muzzle velocity rifle, we've all heard of it, used Mm -hmm. to most of the rest of the world. And you can ask how much energy is in that bullet. And it turns out you running into a quarterback, okay, at 15 miles an hour, okay, not even as fast as you can run, just as fast as might be common. And you hit a quarterback. It is the same amount of kinetic energy as a bullet fired from an AK-47 weapon. The difference is, of course, all the energy of the bullet is entering just a single hole that it puts in your body and it rips out your organs and and it it can kill you. Your energy is now spread. It's the same energy, but it's spread Uh over the entire body of the person. So just to think about this, that, that energy would normally kill someone in one spot, but now it's spread over, so the whole body is participating in absorbing the energy, and that can't be good, is what no. I'm saying. No. That, so that, you just touched on something. You just touched on the reason why I can hate mail from San Francisco today. Oh, because oh, of Joe. <laughs> See, the thing is, what, oh, Joe Joe Montana. Should, oh. yeah, what Joe should realize is it's a good thing that Leonard is as big as he is. No, so when he, when you speak to Joe, oh, oh, just, if he were littler, he'd be dead. Is what you if he was the size of a bullet? Oh, I see what you did there. I see. That's a good one, Gary. That's a good one. I know. Nice. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah. I'll spin him. <laughs> okay, so we how do we, we got to take we a, get somebody very little to hit Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to take him. My, my boy hates Tom Brady. <laughs> Just because everybody's whooping the Phillies' ass all the time. I mean, not oh, the no, Phillies. Well, what we, are they called? We beat, we beat, the, Eagles. We beat the, the Eagles. The Eagles. Okay, mm-hmm. all right. I just will never forgive him. He took our first Super Bowl from in my life. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, okay. Yeah, took it from you. It was yours, right? He took it from you. Right? It from in my you. life, yeah. We got to take a break. Leonard, uh, when we come back, more on this subject. And we're going to set up the whole uh, uh, table mm-hmm. so that when Heather comes in, uh, our neuroscientist, in the third segment, um, she'll put a bow on all of this. And I just want to tell everyone that Heather brought you to us. You already know Heather. And this is, this is just, just spend it like 30 seconds, how, how you found her and how you know each other. I got introduced to Heather by a, a, an organization called Caring Kind, which is in New York City, which I'm being honored for my work in ALS and traumatic brain injury. And um, a young lady by the name of Courtney Dawson, that it would be good for me to talk to Heather because of my life, the traumatic brain injury I'm dealing with, and the fact that CTE dominates my life now, and uh, I combat it and fight it with marijuana and uh, and CBD, and um, you know that's that's okay. How uh, th- excellent. By the way, and that's the a- same reason I combat my problems. <laughs> well, that's what you're marijuana. Okay, that's, Chuck. <laughs> that's that's what I tell everybody. I'm, oh, oh, oh. I'm like, I'm fighting, man. I'm fighting mm, problems. Fight. You got your own things. All that's right. right. All right. I, I'm just trying to help Leonard Marshall out. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. <laughs> All right. When we come back more with our Super Bowl NFL great uh, Leonard Marshall, we're talking about concussions on Star Talk Sports Edition. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition, and we've got somebody who is an NFL great by any metric, who had sustained and persistent dings, as he called them. This is a, a, a head hit in the NFL where you don't quite know where you are when you get up. Yeah, and uh, and our man is here with us today, and it's Leonard Marshall uh, again uh, our, for a second segment here. Leonard, thanks for for uh, giving us this piece of your life and telling us um, what happened to you and how and why. And uh, by the just... way, Leonard, um, uh, just to let you know, the insurance companies <laughs> actually used to allow you to determine how bad an accident was. They would say, uh, describe, and anybody who caused the accident would be like, oh, it's a ding. It's just a ding, <laughs> right? Okay. And the person who received the accident was like, no, th- my car is total. Right, right, right. My car is total. <laughs> you know, and now they say, do the airbags deploy? That's how they determine. Right, right. There it is. There it is. Um, so, uh, Leonard, you finished your career at what year was that? Uh, 1996? 1994 was, my, 94 was my last active season. 
My child was born in 1995. In 96, I decided to hang it up. There it is. And so it, uh, years later, five, six years later, you went to UCLA for a diagnosis of your condition that would normally be identified via autopsy. This yes. is freaky. That's a freaky fact. Yeah. What, yes. Was there some new way to make the measurement or did you just sort of force force it in on people and say, look, something's going on, invent some new test because otherwise I don't want you to do this after I'm dead. This is great how this happened. So I got a phone call from my little brother who happened to be teammates with Rodney Hampton and Otis Anderson. Uh, and those two guys were, uh, were, 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 were like very close to me. Uh, one was with me in Super Bowl 80, uh, 21. And then and one was with me with Super Bowl 25. And then the other was just with me in Super Bowl 25. So one, I played two championships. One, I played one championship. They told me about a program that was going on in an attorney out of Pittsburgh that I needed to speak to. My name is Jason Lukasevic from a law firm, Goldberg, Perskin White. He said, there's a program that's being implemented by Dr. Bennett Amalu. Dr. Amalu happened to be a, a, a neuropathologist from Allegheny County in Pennsylvania and working alongside of Jason Lukasevic's brother in that department, studying brains and autopsies of brains. Long story short, Jason said, hey, Leonard, ESPN is uh, partnering with Tomark to do this brain scan at UCLA at the Nancy Regan Center. Oh, you're interested. I said, well, who else was involved? He said, well, Joe Delamalore, Hall of Famer, Mark Duper, potential Hall of Famer, and, uh, and Tony Dorsett, Hall of Famer. Yeah. Would you be interested in going? I said, count me in. We take the trip to LA. We go through the Tomark process. The process was put in place to determine CTE in the living. Everyone kept saying there's no way you could do and, and perform CTE in the living or obtain the information to collectively convey TT in the living without having these scans and without having an autopsy of the brain. These guys proved it wrong, to be wrong. And this group was based in Chicago, Illinois. So I took the trip, I kicked the tires, ESPN recorded the whole process, and at the end of the day, I came back, I had CTE. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, Dr. Amalo is the the, the the centrum of the film concussion. Correct. I Correct. was going to say, yeah. Right. That's, that's why. That's why you yeah. know the name. So, oh yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Right, Leonard. Hey, please hey. describe to us what the doctors were looking for, and how they went about testing. We said about an MRI brain scan, but what else did they piece together and right, looking for? Otherwise, in a, in an autopsy, they open your skull, pull out your brain, and yeah. put it through a meat slicer, you get a nice thin slice, and they look at it yeah. under the microscope. Sure. And and they say, "Yep, he had." He. So I'm yeah. I'm just glad they didn't. They had another way. Well, I'm just saying. Dude, me too, Neil. I mean, dude, here's what was funny, Neil. They had the they had a PET scan. They had a CAT scan. They had an. They injected me with dye. Yep. They also I also did a neuropsych examination, a, an aptitude test, and from that, that's what I saw. That, yeah, they determined that you know his skill set is not where it should be, given his age. Uh, the number of years he played football, and what he's going through now. So I said, well, fellas, what do we do with this? We came back in 2011. Jason said, Leonard, I just got through talking to Vernon Maxwell. Vernon Maxwell is down to file this lawsuit uh, regarding a concussion claim. Are you interested in doing it? I said, I'm interested in doing it under one synopsis, that we do it on my daughter's birthday so that if I forget because of the debilitation of my brain, due to tall protein on my brain and the tall protein dominating my brain, that my daughter can remember it, I want it on her birthday. Mm. That she'll mm. know every year what her father stood for. Whoa. That's wow. what I did. Mm. Leonard, uh, let me just say on behalf of your daughter, it's a hell of a lot of pressure to put on me, man. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, I, no, I, I'm I, joking. I said like this, John. Go ahead. You know, daddy doesn't make it for another seven, eight, nine, ten years, baby. At least you know there'll be something there for you at the yep. end. No, no, I'm, I'm 100. Yeah. I, th I think it's a great thing. No. It's, uh, yeah. it, I mean, it makes uh, your daughter a part of your legacy, which yes, is exactly absolutely. what you were doing, and absolutely. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I lost Reggie Roby. I lost Reggie Roby to this. I lost your eagle, my brother, Andre Waters, to this. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a couple other guys. I won't mention names because they're dealing with it now. But I can tell you that my friend, who you know very well, um, uh, your middle linebacker, Mr. Mm-hmm. Seth Joyner, uh, was one of the guys that made me step out for Andre. Right. Uh, because right. I had a con- conversation with him, and I told him, I said, Seth, I'm in New York. My voice will carry some, it'll carry some weight, man. If I get behind this with my teammate, Harry Carson, yeah. we'll make enough noise that they'll listen. I said, you're in a little bit of a smaller market down in Philly. You know, they might not take it as serious, but go ahead, man. Make noise. That's your teammate. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that's your teammate. So yeah. when we think of a concussion, typically we think of a, a, a brain injury and the person doesn't know where they are and you got to put them under right, observation right. for 12 hours. We're right. actually talking about something different here where it is the accumulation of smaller right. brain trauma. Correct. Mm-hmm. And so it, and what makes it particularly pernicious is you just pop back from that, not thinking you really should have sat out the rest of the game. Thank and you, so, Neil. and you just keep going and this Thank accumulates and then you get this condition. Am I, Thank am I, we on the same page here? You're on the same page. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think of it this way, Neil. Now, Chuck, you're a big football fan, and I'm quite sure everybody else on here is. My teammate, Lawrence Taylor, was known for using his helmet and his headgear as a weapon. Leading with your head. Leading with your head. So if you led as a defensive player with your head, you make contact. That's why if you look at football today, they teach you not to lead with your head. Mm -hmm. That's because the word word concussion has been taken out of football. We want CTE to be the word associated with football. Right. Because we want people to know the accumulation of hits cause problems down the road. Right. So right. It's one thing to get concussed. It's something else to have, you know, have the shakes and tremors and everything else associated with head trauma. Right, mm-hmm. right. Did putting a name to your condition help? And secondly, when you spoke about the buildup of the tar, pro- tar protein yes. in your brain, yes. how did that, how did the doctors bring that forward for you to explain exactly what the process was, how it goes from you being hit to this development, because it, it seems funny that this can take so long to to present. Well, when 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 it was examined, and I left two people out of this that need to be in this: Dr. Paul Nussbaum, my friend in Pittsburgh, and the team doctor for the for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who was my classmate at LSU, Dr. Julian Bales. Okay, and Julian Bales is in the film. He's portrayed that by Alec Baldwin in the film Concussions. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and and the relationship that he had with Cyril Weck, who was portrayed by, uh, um, God, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, Cyril Weck and, and, and Julian Bales determined that this is what destroyed Mike Webster, okay? It destroyed a number of Pittsburgh Steelers. You got to remember, that was a team that was known for bruising people putting people in the hospital, leading with the headgear. They were taught and trained, and they played the game at a high level like that. That's, they were football, and yeah. they were the, the godfathers of football. And if you were going to be a, a dominant football team, you had to play their style of football in order to be respected. And that's who we were as the New York Giants. That's who we were during, during the era of my career. The game was a lot different, Dr. Neal, uh, than it is today. Today, I hear guys tell me it's called, they should call it something else ball. They don't, mm-hmm, they, they mm-hmm. it's too soft of a game now. You know, it's not like, it's not men playing a game for money now. It's little boys playing a game with quarterbacks with skirts on them and such and such. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Just to be clear, because I like getting the long view on these things. Yeah. Um, what would the leatherheads have said about, the modern football where you have all of this equipment, you know, what, but before football even had leather helmets, right? You go back 120 years, whatever, whenever that was. So I don't think it's something, if you, the, the arc of the game has been to protect your life, right? So. However, I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. Yeah. Um, the number of injuries in the leatherhead uh, era of football was actually less because the pads and the helmets actually became a weapon. 
So it gave players the ability to run faster, hit harder, and make higher impacts, but also because of the equipment they were wearing to all, to also do more damage. Okay, but but also they they weighed 170 pounds, you know. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> you had a bunch of Chuck Nices running around. I know, right, 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 yeah. right. So okay, the, Gary, keep going because right, I know so you got more. How many, how many players currently with us, NFL players, have been diagnosed with CTE? And I go back to two moments in history: 2011, David Dawson; 2012, Junior Sal. Both right. tragically right. took their own lives. Both Did, friends of mine. I'm, I'm sorry, fella. Then. Yeah, man. Did that resonate for you? And were those two points in time something that brought the football community to a better understanding? Or did it just say, oh, well, that's sad and move on? I, I'll tell you why. Well, what I think, okay? David and I were, David Durson and I were really close because he was a former Bear player. He joined my team in 1990. We won the Super Bowl with him mm -hmm. as, a, as a backup safety player. And uh, he played a pivotal role in, a, in, in the progression of our team the whole entire season. His wife was from Baton Rouge. Um, I knew his family because of that. Um, he pledged Omega Psi Phi in my fraternity. Um, I wrote an intake letter for him. I became a real brother to him. And uh, I introduced him into the fraternity through Chicago and a bunch of friends in Chicago. Um, David had a great business. He had a great mind. He was on the board in Notre Dame. He was um, um, uh, the number two supplier of breakfast meat to McDonald's and Burger King worldwide. Wow. He had a real strong head for business and, uh, you know, just a really good guy. The same applied for Junior Sale. Uh, and and, and what, was, what was striking for me was when we introduced the movie Concussions uh, out in L.A. to the world, um, I got a chance to sit with uh, Junior Sale and his Junior Seau's family and his daughter um, at the uh, the premiere of the uh, of the film, and uh, and just listen to his daughter talk about her dad and talk about what it meant growing up with him in the household and everything else. And it was just sad how she talked that you know I will never have those moments in time again with him. Mm -hmm. I'll never understand who my father really was outside of football. Uh, it will always reflect on me that his life was football. He played in the league, what, 17, 18 years. Um, it's just, it just, it was, it really hit me, hit home for me, man. That's, that's why I say what I say, you know. Uh, I have a daughter, and, and someday she's going to reflect upon what my body of work was. And I just wanted to have the fondest memories of that. You know, my father stood for something. He was a principal kind of dude. And uh, he didn't let his brothers down. That's, you know, yeah. I keep thinking, I keep thinking, none, why is any of this even a lawsuit? It should just be, yeah, okay, this is, you know, NFL is not short of money. Nope. And, and of course, this affliction is many people, but it's not everyone in the NFL, right? Uh, it's probably not happening to the place kickers, right? So, so it's, so, so it, it would be, a sad indictment of the NFL if the only resolution to come of this is only after they are sued. I mean, that just looks bad. It means, okay. they, it means they're re reluctant, resistant. I'll do it if court makes us do it, but otherwise, no. I mean, what, what, are we, what, what industry are we all supporting out here? Look at this way, Dr. Tyson. 70% of the National Football League is black. The players are African-American. Okay? We sued. Okay? Uh, there was a, an award of a settlement. 90% of the players that retire from the NFL are going to end up with CTE. That's a fact. That came wow. from Dr. Ann McKee at, the University of, at Boston University. Uh, and also Dr. Robert Kahn. So these are things that we know. There are, now there's racial norming in this case where the neuropsychs have taken race and used race against the 70% black players mm -hmm. to say, well, you, did, you had a learning disability to begin with, right. so you're probably dumb now because you had that issue when you're right. a kid, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's just an articulation of you growing your life, but mm -hmm. yet 
you're not getting any smarter. Well, well yeah, yeah. So and, much uh, horse shit. What for, okay? for what uh, people don't realize what Leonard's talking about is if, if we go back to the aptitude test that he talked about that he had to take. So what happens is all the players have to take these neuropsych aptitude tests where they have to answer a certain amount of questions to see how proficient they are mentally. Yeah. And Correct. so the NFL is saying basically you guys are at a lower rate coming in because you're not that smart coming to in. begin with. So right. you didn't lose any real brain function because wow. your brain function was already low. And as a result, these players are now not uh, uh, the funds to protect these players after they played are no longer available to these these players that do not do as well on the test. So that's Correct. the Wonderlick test, isn't it? Where you no, have that's... The one that no. is what you use when you come into the game, but in the 16 PF used to be in the performance. Those uh -huh. three applications used to be used when you were coming into the league. Those declared whether you were going to be a first, second, or third round draft pick, or if you're going to be selected at all, because mm -hmm. you can't read that playbook and learn it. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to comprehend it. Yeah. So you have players that are like that. I mean, and you know, I've, I've seen some guys, the talent outweighs their smarts on the field. And that's the kind of play you just kind of let him go and do what he's got to do. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. got the other situation that's going on with the racial norming that, you know, that they're, they're saying that, well, you weren't that smart to begin with. You badly had a C average in college. And now we're giving you this test. You're testing at a, at a D grade level. So we don't think that you were injured or, or anything happened to your brain. We just take you down. Right. Wow. That's not right. cool. That's and that's not too cool. All right, Leonard, you mentioned two, two doctors, Dr. McKee, Dr. Anne McKee, and Dr. Robert Cantu. They are, they're part of the Concussion Legacy Foundation? That's correct. Right. So someone out there is fighting the good fight. No How doubt. far are they getting with this? Are they progressing at all? Is there some kind of way that they are making progress? Well, I'm on the board of CLF. Okay. And CLF is doing everything they can. Chris Lewinsky does a fantastic, a fantastic job fighting for players and their families, and and their kids' kids. Um, so I can't I can't say enough good things about CLF. Dr. McKee and Dr. Cantu have always been um, uh, the brain trust behind uh, what's going on with the science of the brain and how it affects former players in both the NHL, the NFL, and some that have been injured in the NBA and Major League Baseball. So, you know, the work that they do is is is, is consequential to um, a high level of transparency to players in that family. And, and, and we respect and appreciate that. I think that some people don't, like Dr. Tyson was talking about, they don't respect the science and the science doesn't lie. The science is the science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bottom line, the science is the science. You're in the right place for that, Leonard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are definitely so, in the right place. So we got we got to uh, bring this segment to a close. Just before we do, um, are you you've been very active just as a as a proponent and as a supporter of all these causes related to just people's health after you know just is the title of your book all over again when the cheering stops. Um, are, are you up for an award coming up? I, I'm up for an I, award. No. That's funny you bring it up, Dr. Tyson. I'm up for an award from Karen Kine. Um, the, uh, the dinner is at the, the Pierre Hotel in New York, the St. Pierre Hotel in New York. It happens on June the 6th, 2022. And uh, it's the ALS Society that's honored me for my work in this space. Oh, and man. The fact man. that I've been a real proponent. And Good. Congratulations, Leonard. Thank you very well, much. I'll tell you this. If we gave awards, we give you an award right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, it, but it wouldn't be at the Pierre Hotel. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Man, that place that is man. expensive. <laughs> Chuck, <laughs> Chuck, you can be called, baby. <laughs> no, we'll do drive through <laughs> That's Park Avenue East, baby. <laughs> well, it is. It is. He's right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Leonard, it's been a delight to have you. A kind of sad delight. I mean, I'm yeah. glad somebody's paying attention to this. Yes. And that it's um, and it sounds like all all forces are aligned to resolve this in some way to redress the problems that have happened before and to prevent them from ever happening again. And we got to shed a little bit of that testosterone macho 
on yes. the field. It's still an entertaining game, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's still drawing the crowds. And, uh, you know, to be tackled doesn't mean you have to not get up after it. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying. You can't take contact out of this sport because no. if you do, this is no longer NFL football. The only I get it. But it there are ways to make contact where you're not a bullet oh, passing totally. through somebody's. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. The only way to take it out is to take the head out. And you can't take the head out of football. That would be weird if you just had bodies running up and down. <laughs> Headless <laughs> bodies. <laughs> can't do it. All right, Leonard, it's been a delight. Thank you for being on, on Star Talk. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna pivot now to uh, to Heather Berlin in our third segment. And we'll tell her you said hi, Leonard, and it was, yep. we're delighted that she brought you to us. Uh, 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 Godspeed, uh, stay healthy, Thank and you. Uh, give us a holler again if you got more to tell on this about I, this story. I certainly will, guys. All right, dude. Have a good All right. Day. When Thank we come you. back, our third segment will be with our our neuroscientist at large, Heather Berlin, will sort of uh, figure out what's going on here and why and wh where it's going to head uh, in the future of the sport. This is Star Talk. See you in a moment. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition. We're talking about concussions and and mini concussions, actually, the, the kind that accumulate and turn into something really bad later in life. Something that, of course, football players uh, suffer from. Many have didn't even know that this was going on. And in particular, we went through two segments with our special guest, Leonard Marshall, former football player with the New York Giants, two-time Super Bowler. And uh, Chuck, was he an offensive tackle? Is that what, what his title defensive. is? Defensive. No, he was, he was de defensive. Yeah. Defensive tackle, protecting yeah. the... Uh, so he's, Coming after guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he he's was, coming after the other team's quarterback. He's yeah. a hit man. That's what he is. No, he, was, the, he was very good at it. Right, yes. He <laughs> was yes, more than yes. very good at it. Him and, him and uh, Lawrence, uh, Taylor. Lawrence Taylor together, it, they were... Ugh. I hate they them were, so they much. They were a wrecking crew. Oh, they were so, so awful. So, Ugh. so oh, against your team. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> they made it so, so hard for me. For you and your Eagles. So they plucked the Eagles bald. Ooh, yes, they that did. That was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> so, um, so we don't have particular expertise in the neurology of this, but of course we have a friend of Star Talk, our go-to person, our neuro neuroscientist at large, Heather Berlin. Heather, welcome back to Star Talk. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So he mentioned that he had a, a battery of tests that, in recent years, enabled medical professionals to diagnose this accumulation of small bits of brain damage mm -hmm. uh, known as CTE. And I always forget what that stands for. It's Cro chron chronic traumatic encephalopathy. The, the, hence the abbreviation, yes. <laughs> CTE. <laughs> yes. And so, so- My head uh, hurts apparent, just saying that. Yeah, I know, right? Right, so what we had learned was in the day, you would never know this until the patient was dead. And mm -hmm. then you do your normal um, uh, brain slicing on the autopsy. But apparently there's some progress mm -hmm. where you can do this in the living patient. Mm -hmm. But um, it, how how definitive can that be relative to just say, Look, dude, give me your brain. I'll slice it open and then I'll let you know. <laughs> I mean, still the gold standard, if you want to know with um, 100 percent, you know, definitive is to look postpartum. It's the same thing with Alzheimer's as well. You really have to see these um, particular pattern of these plaques, these tau proteins and these tangles. Um, but if you kind of piece together a bunch of different tests, some MRI and there's particular patterns looking at PET and and tau build up in particular parts of the brain, along with these clinical tests like neurocognitive testing, you can start to get a full picture where you can give a pretty accurate diagnosis of CTE, but it's still not at 100% so you actually see the neuropathology in the brain itself. I know Chuck, I know, um, Chuck and Gary are busting with questions. Uh, Gary, what do you have for her right now? The tau protein, it, it just changes and develops in a certain way, doctor. So mm. how is it changing? Why is it changing from an impact? But it doesn't change. Normally, if you have impact on, on the body, a bruise appears. Right. But this, this protein change happens but, and, and the bruise And the bruise heals. Yeah. Right? And, and then and you're, the change you're, you're happens maybe new. decades later. So mm. what is the process that's going on in there? 
So, okay. Part of it is um, right when you get the impact, you have this kind of neurochemical cascade that occurs. Um, mm-hmm. You have the release of certain, um, uh, you have basically what's called neural depolarization, which releases these excitatory neurotransmitters. And it kind of shifts the balance in the brain. It changes the glucose metabolism um, and the blood flow. And then that in turn can impair the axonal function. So basically, um, a lot of these tau, these tau proteins are in the white matter. They're in the sort of microtubules of the brain. And when right. you have this complex neurochemical cascade that occurs when there's been a traumatic injury, it sets off this process, which has a distinct, you know, in the course of a couple of days, you can see it a distinct sort of process. But then it can take years for the sort of full damage for the death of the neurons to occur because there's sort of a buildup. If you think of it like... Um, you know, in the arteries, when you're having a kind of buildup of plaque over time, but it does, it takes a while until you actually have like a heart attack, right? So if you think of, in the most simplest terms, like a buildup of sort of gunk that was set off by this initial neurochemical process, and over time, it can lead to neuronal death. Um, mm. And I think that's the easiest way to explain it without getting too- And, and the neuronal death that when mm-hmm. you're talking about the death of these neurons, so basically that's the transmission of, you know, information in the brain. That's how the brain talks to the brain, right? Right. Well, I mean, it's mostly, you know, these, it's the white matter. So, so think about this. You have the, the brain, this very soft piece of matter inside a very rough bony um, skull that has all these little ridges. And when you get this acceleration deceleration event, um, the brain kind of shakes within this. this That's the polite way to say you got hit in the head. Right. (laughs) Exactly. You get banged in the head. (laughs) You get banged, the acceleration, deceleration, you get banged in the head. Exactly. And sometimes they technically, we call it a coup counter coup event, but this rocking sort of back and forth. Now there's different density between the gray matter and the white matter in the brain. So they kind of stretch and they move at different rates. So that causes a stretching or tearing or shearing in the white matter. Um, when you have the kind of shaking of the of the brain within the skull, this tearing causes this neurochemical cascade that I that I spoke about. But that's how they communicate. The white matter, where this shearing effect occurs, this tearing, this pulling, it affects the communication between different brain areas. Um, and ultimately, so that's one aspect that can cause some of the symptoms. Um, and the other is that you have a, eventually this. Um, this neurodegeneration where you get start to have brain death, which is akin to kind of what happens in an Alzheimer's process or, or other neurodegenerative disorders. On a personal level, Heather, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I headed a football or a soccer ball, if you prefer, for many years and quite some time ago. And I would have last played a competitive game in the mid-90s. Mm-hmm. So the question uh, is, how long will it be yeah, before totally. Gary... Can no longer have this conversation. There you go. <laughs> well, <laughs> so you know, it it kind of it it. Uh, there's a couple of things. It could set off a process if you already have a kind of vulnerability toward a neurodegenerative disorder. It could make you more vulnerable. So there's something we call cognitive reserve, which is uh-huh. basically kind of what is your baseline if you have a lot of different connections in the brain. You know, it, um, that you can afford to lose a little bit of cognitive function, mm. or a little bit of structural stability um, or integrity and still kind of be OK and get by. Right. So. So, mm-hmm. so Heather, we have no idea how smart Gary was before the show. So <laughs> yeah. we, we only know him. An in his current state. <laughs> yeah. You think? <laughs> we only know him in his current state. But Gary, you said it's not only did you use your head during the game. Practice. You practiced. Yeah. Mm. And you have to, you will learn a technique to head a football in the most efficient way. Which is how? Your forehead? You meet it on the forehead, yeah. Made it right on the forehead. And you develop develop muscular density here to strengthen so as you're able, so as you don't get the whiplash if the ball hits you in the head when you connect with it. So you develop things like you would with muscles for running. So you develop. I see. So you protected your your neck vertebrae, Mm -hmm. but your brain is mush. 
Probably. Like that's what you're saying. Well, I, I, more or less. Right. Like, listen, it's not a good thing to be bunting balls no. your head. But the the thing is, not everybody develops CTE, right? It's a percentage. Um, Keep of- cheering me up, doctor. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so maybe yeah. you know, maybe thirty percent. I think is some the statistic of the people who are, let's okay. say, playing in sports that are bunting, bunting their head or, or taking a lot of um, hits. Um, and so you know. I think we still don't fully understand why certain people develop it and others don't. Certain people have multiple concussions over time. It could it could have to do with certain vulnerabilities. It could have to do with the hmm. age at which you started having these small oh. head injuries. Um, oh. And and it's kind of like COVID right now. You know, some people get it and it's devastating and horrible, and others are you know asymptomatic and perfectly fine. And I think that there is an underlying mechanism. It could be related to genetics. We don't know yet. Um, but so there's some hope for you. Um, Gary, were you wearing a mask while you were heading the ball? <laughs> That's the most important thing. Yeah. Were you socially distanced? So, you Heather, I've read that, yeah. Heather, I've read that there are no uh, pain neurons in the brain. Is yeah. that right? So, yeah. so you would have no idea that you were undergoing this slow oh, wow. damage. Whereas a tiny little pinprick anywhere on your skin, you hmm. would know. I mean, even in the most obscure places. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing, and especially the, in the most obscure places. <laughs> Chuck, um, <laughs> okay. That is one of the most fascinating things about the brain. Is so I'm I'm fortunate enough to be involved in some um, neurosurgery when we're doing brain mapping. So, for example, we want to map out a person's getting a lesion removed, and we want to make sure we don't take out their language area. So we, while they're in, in surgery, we can wake them up. We can be inside that. Oh, that's brain. nice of you. That's yeah. nice of you to yeah, just exactly. not want to take out. You sound like a military operation <laughs> right. to take it's out the like, language. Uh, so how are you feeling? <laughs> 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 Man, they're fine. They're fine. Yeah, they're um, fine. like young Frank, young Frankenstein. <laughs> um, right. But no, so we grab, we piece by piece, we, we use electrical stimulation and stimulate each piece and have a person talk. And eventually we hit an area where they literally just, they can't talk anymore. And we know not to take out that area, but the point is that I'm oh, not to remove the area in a very delicate way, but um, <laughs> the <laughs> point oh my is- god! So you're telling me that something as sophisticated as neurosurgery, mm-hmm. y'all just it, poking around? It's really <laughs> right. It, so you're telling me electricians, electricians yeah, are better electrophysiologists and finding in. the electrical. Connection. Little, little machine, you, like no little, electrician would start poking your walls to figure out where the wires are. <laughs> we have pretty waves, much where yeah. we're at. Um, but the amazing wow. thing is that the person is awake, their skull is open. We're literally, you know, inside their brain, and they don't feel any of it. Right. The thing that creates all of our pain sensations doesn't feel anything itself when it's being touched or stimulated or cut into. That's deep. Right. That's and deep. it can bleed yeah. and be cut into, but you don't, you don't feel it, but it, but it's the seat of pain itself. So um, the thing about it with CTE and, and other, you know, symptoms from traumatic brain injury is that it's, it's a silent, um, people are suffering with it in silence because you can't see it, right? You can see, see it. So you can see it a little bit with these hyper intensities, we call it on MRI, the little white spots that show up over time, but really it's subjective. The person is saying, I have a brain fog. I, I can't concentrate. I can't read, or they start acting impulsively. Um, but, but you don't feel pain itself other than headaches is an often, often people complain of having a headache, but that's really the meninges. Like a headache is not the brain itself hurting. It's actually like a migraine is the, the surrounding membrane that does have pain sensors in it. And that's where you right. actually feel the headache. Like what, like when you get a hangover, that's my migraine. I mean, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> Heather, Heather does, does the brain not have a capacity for regeneration in certain places or in, in all of it? It does. I mean, it's it's amazingly, I mean, it's 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 very susceptible to damage, but it, it is amazingly able to kind of heal in to an extent. So a lot of it is compensatory, right? You can, if as long as certain structures are in place, if you have damage, you can maybe build alternative routes, alternative. Rewire. Rewire. Your brain rewires. Rewire. Yeah. But when you start to have these neurodegenerative processes, so much of the brain is affected across the board. It starts to atrophy. You're losing gray matter. So like I said, at first you get these white matter tears, but eventually that leads to death of the cell body, the gray matter. 
And, and then you don't have the actual structure to support the, the brain function, the cognitive function anymore. So you can compensate to an extent. So if you have one area of a brain lesion that doesn't spread, right? It's not a neurodegenerative um, disorder. You can create these alternative pathways to sort of circumvent that, that damaged area. But when you start having a globally damage, there's only so much the brain can do um, to compensate. Right. So Heather, I just want to, just to, just to establish a baseline here. Of all sciences, yours is the most constricted by what kind of experiments you can do, right? I mean, a chemist can just remix the Petri dish or, or the biologist and, and do it at a different temperature, under different acidity, a different uh, lighting condition, whatever. You can't just walk up to people in the street, can, can I play with your brain? You know, like, you can't do that. So. So how far behind are you? Or, or let, let me rather rather than rather than boast how far we've come, mm -hmm. how much more remains to be discovered? Okay, so I mean, look, there, there's a lot of work we can do. Um, I don't do this research, but there are people in the fields who are doing animal research, right? And there you can do much more um, oh. controlled experiments in animals um, that you can't do in humans. Part of what I have always done is I try to create experiments that would be in humans that are analogous to what we're able to do in animals, but we have to kind of wait for the um, right subjects to emerge. So let me give you an example. Like one is, for example, part of my PhD work was I looked at what what is the part of the brain, the orbital prefrontal cortex, what does it do? And so in animal models and mice you, and, and monkeys, you can lesion that part of the brain specifically and then do experiments. You can't go in and lesion a, a human, so what I had to do is sort through, this was in London um, at, at King's College London, the neurosurgery department, sort through patient files of patients who have come in, who are still alive, who have had the particular type of brain surgery because it was removal of a tumor or because they had damage to that part of the brain because of a, a stroke or an aneurysm, where I would find those specific patients that happen to have damage to that part of the brain and then bring them in for a study. But that takes longer. So the thing is we can do these studies, but the, the length of time it takes to gather the patients who have naturally gotten damage to these parts of the brain, let's say, um, can, can um, increase the length of time it takes us to make these discoveries. So if I was to give you a number, I mean, like it's very hard to say how much longer you know it's taking us because we don't have control in human studies, but we are developing techniques where we can do non-invasive stimulation to brain parts, which in effect knock them out temporarily. And that's helping us um, make some advances. So we're getting more creative with the kinds of experiments we do in humans. So Heather, we gotta, we gotta bring this to a close, but before we do, could you tell us how you came to know about Leonard Marshall's case? Because you brought him to us for us yeah. to create this show. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was, I was, I do a lot of work with um, Alzheimer's patients and people with neurodegenerative disorders and as well of with CTE. And um, I was connected with him basically to talk uh, to, to him about his, the cognitive functioning problems that he's having and see if there's any um, treatments and also to help, you know, spread the word about this because it's, it's a major problem that I think needs to, that, that in, in some ways, you know, is not getting the kind of coverage that I think it needs. There's a lot of people suffering with this and, um, and they're doing it behind the scenes. So I, he was- And I think speaking, we learned offline, what was it? Was it offline, Chuck, where we were talking about uh, helmet brain or something or head brain? What's the, with, with sled, sled head. Yeah, sled head. Sled head a, yeah. A, a bob sledder is where they're, you know, you see the just camera. Constantly it's the head is, yeah, it's, it's constantly vibrating. On, on the ice. So this sounds like a broader issue with regard to sports where your head gets dinged, right? I mean, this is obviously it's not just football. I, I think, you know, a hundred years from now, we're going to look back on the way we've played sports and how little we, we, you know, how much we disregarded the damage that was happening to the brain. And we're going to think, you know, just the way we look back to the 19, I don't know, fifties and everybody was smoking, including doctors and, you know, saying it was good for you. Like, I think we're going to look back on this and look at it with similar disdain. Um, there's a lot of money involved in sports and a lot of people say, well, they get paid millions of dollars. So I guess they're sacrificing their, you know, 
brain as a consequence. Yeah, no, no. But right, right, right. Yeah. Anyway, I think. Well, that, by, I think by that, that time, all know. sports will be played by robots, right. <laughs> and all the kids playing video games now will be the real athletes who are controlling those robots. <laughs> okay. And you know, and then there will be a big movement of people who are like saying, "Well, you know, we have to care about the robots." And their brains, you know, because their central processing units are getting damaged in this sport. And why should they this, give their this their is life? Chuck's Chuck's uh, uh, sci-fi apocalyptic thriller? <laughs> yeah, man. <Yes. laughs> but I, I do out. think um, I, I do think that the way that you know we care very much about athletes' physical bodies, and they have trainers, and they take care of them, and they get massages, whatever. We should think about also taking care of the brain as well and brain health um, in the process. That That's a place we, we haven't arrived at yet, mm-hmm. but it is mm-hmm. completely where we should be headed. Neil, yeah. in the because future, it, we probably will have way less more contact in our sports. Mm-hmm. And uh, the sort of extreme sports, that, and you might then push what we consider mainline sports like sledding and push them into the extreme category and then reduce that because of the damage that's potentially taking place. Mm-hmm. Or maybe just take heading out of soccer as well, right? There's That's a- on its yeah. way. That, yeah. that yeah. I can tell you, maybe in 30 years' time, there will not be heading of, of a football. Um, and maybe in 30 years' time in soccer, they'll just use their hands. Because what the hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> That's what there. you got them for! Just dangling there, I mean, doing what? nothing. <laughs> Two perfectly good utensils with opposable thumbs, and you're like, "No, nah, we can't use those." What would we ever use those for? Okay, Chuck just blew a gasket, which means it's time to close this out. Okay. <laughs> Gary, Chuck, good to have you, and Heather, it is a delight always to have you uh, enlighten us in all of your neurological ways. All right, this has been Star Talk Sports Edition. As always, I bid you to keep looking up.